If you think all elephants have upward curving tusks, think again. Millions of years ago, a giant named Platybelodon roamed the swamps of Asia, Africa, and North America with a completely different weapon, a large flat pair of lower tusks that looked just like a shovel. This unique animal challenged everything we know about elephants and that shovel became one of paleontology's greatest mysteries. This is the story of how one unique creature defied all the rules and how scientists finally unraveled this mystery. For more than a century, scientists have thought it used this strange jaw to scoop up mud from swamps like a prehistoric excavator. The idea of Platybelodon as a swamp shoveler took shape almost as soon as its fossils were pulled from the ground. When paleontologists like Henry Fairfield Osborne examined those skulls in the early 1900s, the flat, outward, flaring lower tusks looked like something designed for digging, with Miocene landscapes already known to include river systems and wetlands, the pieces seemed to fit together. Early reconstructions leaned on the obvious wide, flat, lower tusks looked like shovels, so museums showed them in marshes. But later researchers began asking whether the wear on those tusks actually matched months of scraping mud. At the time, this interpretation was less fanciful than it sounds today. The Miocene spanning about 15 to 5 million years ago was marked by large floodplains and patches of wetland where grazing and browsing animals thrived. An elephant relative whose jaw resembled a coal shovel fit neatly into assumptions about such habitats. Illustrators drew whole herds wading in reed beds, jaws submerged as they scooped aquatic vegetation. Museum dioramas placed them firmly in muddy channels, displaying them the same way textbooks described them, strange elephants harvesting a swampy diet. That repetition turned the image into a scientific default firmly entrenched in both scholarship and public imagination. Still not everyone was fully persuaded. A few paleontologists pointed out that tusks used as dredging tools should show heavy evidence of abrasion. Sand and grit are destructive over time, scouring ivory and leaving distinctive polish and scratches. Yet when jaws were studied more closely, some specimens failed to show the extreme wear one might expect from a lifetime of raking through sediment. Others displayed cracks and breakage that didn't line up with the swamp shoveler picture. These were small notes of caution in an era when direct testing methods were limited, but the doubts never went away. The problem was evident. For decades, reconstructions rested mostly on matching form to function by analogy with tools familiar to human eyes. But bones don't just suggest outlines or silhouettes. They also preserve traces of use. Even before modern scanning technology, the surfaces of teeth and tusks carried physical records of how an animal fed. A few careful researchers noticed that the striations on molars and tusks did not always reinforce the idea of aquatic grazing. They couldn't yet say exactly what alternative diet was involved, but they could sense the puzzle wasn't solved by shovel imagery alone. But the bones have a finer record than any diorama tiny marks that tell a different tale. We'll get to those next. What scientists began to realize was that the answers weren't locked in Platybelodon's jaw shape alone, but in the subtle marks left on its teeth and tusks. Every time an animal chews, scrapes food or pulls bark, minute scars are carved into enamel. These scars are the basis of dental microware um, analysis, and in Platybelodon, they offered evidence that did not fit the old swamp dredger image. Microware on its molars shows many fine scratches and polished surfaces resembling the patterns seen in modern browsers that clip twigs and leaves. By contrast, they lack the dull, deeply abraded marks expected in an animal constantly raking sand and grit from mud. The tusks too carried a story. Instead of the coarse, heavily worn patterns from abrasive shoveling, their microware was surprisingly fine, consistent with scraping along plant surfaces such as bark rather than dragging through sediment. This combination strongly suggested browsing behaviors working above ground rather than dredging underwater. These results came into sharper focus as additional specimens were examined. A detailed reanalysis in the 1990s showed tusk wear that better matched bark stripping or cutting plant stems than any scenario of scooping riverbeds. Gerald Lambert and colleagues compared tusk surfaces with known wear from browsing animals and found tight parallels. For the first time, the browsing interpretation outweighed the swamp hypothesis with clear microscopic evidence. One of the more surprising details was how consistent the microware patterns were across different age classes. 
Juvenile platybelodons displayed the same fine scratches adults did, indicating they too fed on twigs and leafy brows. That doesn't match the expectation that only large, heavy-jawed adults would shovel for aquatic plants while juveniles stayed on softer diets. The same scratch pattern appears on young and old teeth, which is what you see when animals of all ages browse similar woody vegetation, not when only adults engage in strenuous sediment dredging. Researchers also noticed subtle shifts with age. Older individuals carried more and wider scratches, hinting they tackled tougher, woodier material more frequently than juveniles. This nuance enriched the picture while all age groups browsed plants above ground. Dietary variation increased with maturity, reflecting the physical abilities of larger adults rather than a fundamental difference in feeding style. It is important to note the time scale at work here. Microware records what an animal ate in its last days or weeks, not an entire lifetime. It is essentially a snapshot of the recent diet. That limited window actually makes the evidence sharper. These teeth preserve a feeding record right before the individuals died. And from those snapshots, the pattern is clear. Platybelodon's jaws functioned more like slicing and stripping tools than mud scoops. So by the late 20th century, the fossil record itself through scratches invisible to the eye was signaling a major reinterpretation. The iconic shovel jaw was not a dredging device, but an adaptation for processing branches, bark, and woody foliage. Yet teeth and tusks could only say what the animals were eating in the short term. To uncover the kinds of landscapes they occupied and the environments that shaped them, researchers needed another line of evidence hidden deeper inside the enamel. A second window into Platybelodon's life comes not from scratches on the surface of its teeth, but from the chemistry sealed inside the enamel itself. Unlike bone enamel does not remodel after it forms, so it locks in a chemical snapshot of the diet and water sources from when the tooth was growing. Researchers working with fossils from mid-Miocene deposits in northern China sampled these enamel layers and studied their stable isotopes, carbon and oxygen, to ask whether Platybelodon really belonged to swamps or whether it occupied more varied settings. The carbon isotope data, especially delta 13C values, turned out to be especially informative. Um, plants follow different photosynthetic pathways with trees and shrubs using the C3 system and many warm season grasses using the C4 system. Animals eating mostly C3 foods show low delta 13C values, while those grazing on grasses show higher ones. Early platybelodon teeth from these Chinese deposits sit firmly in the C3 range, pointing to a diet dominated by woody vegetation. Yet some later teeth shift slightly upward, consistent with the inclusion of more open habitat plants. This does not mean the animals turned into pure grazers, but it does suggest that browse from forests gave way to a mixed menu that incorporated grasses as regional environments opened. Timing adds context. That dietary shift aligns closely with a mid-Miocene climate transition. After the mid-Miocene climate optimum global cooling produced fragmented forests and spreading grasslands across many regions. In the Linksia Basin of northwest China, paleoecological studies show exactly this pattern. Dense woods broke apart into mosaic landscapes that combined trees, shrubs, and expanding grassy areas. The carbon isotope record in Platybelodon teeth follows the same trajectory, indicating that the animals tracked these changes as their home ranges opened. Oxygen isotopes gave another clue. Delta 18O levels vary depending on rainfall, evaporation and water source, which can reflect whether animals lived in closed, humid environments or more open, evaporative ones. The platybelodon samples returned values more consistent with open floodplains or river margins than with shaded swamp settings. In practice, this means their drinking water and vegetation grew in places where evaporation carried a stronger influence, unlike the buffered waters typical of closed marshes. Together with the carbon results, the case for swamp-bound specialization grew even weaker. A comparison with other proboscideans highlights the point. Chwerolophodon, for example, shows isotope ratios tied to dense closed canopy forests in the same deposits, a specialist browser that stayed in woodland settings. Gomphotherium, often described as more generalized presence, mixed isotope signals that straddle both forests and open habitats. Platybelodon trends toward the open side of that gradient, suggesting that its flattened jaws were not built for dredging weeds in stagnant water, but were instead being used in more exposed habitats where feeding involved bark stripping and branch cutting as well as some grass consumption. 
This niche differentiation helps explain how several giant proboscideans coexisted side by side without chasing exactly the same foods. What makes the enamel chemistry so compelling is how clearly it grounds behavioral reconstructions in measurable data. The shift in D13C values shows platybelodon feeding across a spectrum of plants rather than remaining an aquatic grazer. The D18O values reinforce the idea that the animals drank in open evaporative settings instead of closed swamps. And when placed in chronological order, these findings show that platybelodon's dietary ecology moved in step with environmental change recorded independently in the sediments of northern China. By narrowing the view to a particular time and region, it becomes clear that the swamp shoveler idea does not line up with the chemical record. Instead, what emerges is a picture of a browser-grazer hybrid navigating fragmented woodlands and expanding grasslands, not a specialist bound to marshes. The enamel evidence shifts Platybelodon's story from stagnant waters to dynamic landscapes. That evidence raises the next question. If Platybelodon lived in these more open habitats, what exactly did it do with its broad, flattened jaws? The answer is not only about shape, but about how those jaws worked together with the rest of its face. What researchers discovered is that Platybelodon's feeding system worked best when viewed as a partnership between its shovel-like jaw and its trunk. For decades, the jaw alone was imagined as a dredging scoop, but biomechanical testing painted a different picture. Using finite element analysis, a digital method of stress testing bones, scientists simulated what would happen if the mandibles pushed through mud, cut against vegetation, or endured twisting forces. The outcome showed that the jaw was not equally suited to all tasks. Finite element results revealed that the mandible performed poorly under heavy vertical forces, like those that would result from digging deeply into sediment or uprooting plants. The stress concentration suggested the bone structure could not withstand repeated heavy loads. However, the same models showed stronger performance when forces acted horizontally obliquely or during controlled vertical slices through softer material. In short, the jaw was not built for earth moving, but handled branch cutting forces with relative stability. Compared to its relatives, Platybelodon occupied a middle ground. One contemporaneous shovel, jawed species seemed mechanically stronger at horizontal slicing, while another was more of a generalist. Platybelodon's jaw was well suited for one job, taking a taut branch or bark strip and shearing through it. This finding raised the question of how those branches came into position. The answer lies above the jaws in the trunk. All proboscideans had trunks to some degree, and in Platybelodon, the skull presents anatomical evidence for a trunk longer and more flexible than in its immediate predecessors. The nasal openings, or naria, are placed high on the skull, a feature linked to more developed trunks. To be clear, it was not identical to a modern elephant's, but the narial morphology points to a capable grasping structure that could manipulate food in ways earlier, shorter trunked relatives could not. Put together three independent lines of evidence converge. Microware studies fit with branch cutting instead of sediment dredging. Finite element analysis shows the jaw worked better for slicing than for resisting high digging loads. Skull features are consistent with a derived trunk capable of grasping and pulling. When combined, the most plausible feeding strategy emerges. The trunk acted as an active manipulator, curling around branches, pulling them into position or stripping bark, while the lower tusks with their flattened distal edges provided the cutting surface. The result is a trunk jaw team that functioned like two parts of a plant processing machine. This view reshapes how Platybelodon interacted with its habitat. Instead of standing belly deep in swamps, dragging its jaw like a dredge, it probably roamed more open floodplains and woodland margins, using its trunk to position shrubs and twigs for slicing. Its cousins illustrate the contrast. Gomphotherium, often interpreted as a generalist with a broader diet, did not show the same mandibular specialization. Churilophodon remained tied to forest foliage. Platybelodon, meanwhile, combined a longer trunk with a sharp blade-like jaw to exploit mixed environments of trees, shrubs, and scattered grasses. This cooperative anatomy gave it ecological flexibility during a period of shifting Miocene landscapes. Some have speculated that the broad jaw might have doubled as a defensive tool, but that remains conjecture. The evidence we actually have microware, biomechanics, and trunk anatomy all point to feeding mechanics, not combat. What stands firm is that the shovel was never intended for mud scooping at all. 
Its true role appears to have been as one half of a versatile system where trunk and jaw worked in coordination to slice, strip and process vegetation efficiently. This reinterpretation also highlights a larger lesson. Anatomical puzzles become clearer when multiple lines of evidence are tested together. For platybelodon, a combination of scratches on enamel isotopes in teeth and mechanical models finally reframed its story. Platybelodon's unusual jaw no longer stands for swamp dredging, but for a feeding strategy built on trunk jaw cooperation. The old image came from early reconstructions that relied on anatomy alone, but microware and tuskware reveal behavior tied to browsing leaves, twigs, and bark instead of shoveling sediment. Enamel isotope studies from mid-Miocene China record a dietary shift toward more open habitats and finite element tests show the jaws worked best for vertical and oblique cutting. Together, these findings outline a system adapted to branch processing where trunk and jaw worked as partners. As open grasslands spread and forests and wetlands shrank during later Miocene climate shifts, these specialized feeders lost much of their ecological niche, a strong explanation for their regional decline. If you enjoyed this spork elephant reversal, consider liking the video, subscribing, and sharing your own thoughts in the comments.